grade sevens. I'm Helen and we are doing natural sciences. We've been looking at conduction and convection as ways of heat energy transfer. And the focus of our lesson today is investigating convection. So let's remind ourselves about what we've learned about convection. Remember that our clue to remembering what convection is, is that currents carry heat energy. So heat energy is transferred by the process of convection and it's due to convection currents. And heat energy is transferred in gases and in liquids due to convection. The convection currents are created by moving particles in the liquid or the gas. So we looked at our example of a kettle boiling water and we see that the water particles that are close to the heat surface or the heat source should I say, they are going to gain kinetic energy, move faster, create greater space between the particles and therefore become less dense. And so they rise. But as the particles lose some of that kinetic energy, they fall. And so we see a constant current created of rising and falling little particles of either the liquid or the gas. In the case of the kettle, of course, it was a liquid, but we've seen that we can warm up rooms of gas, which is the air around us, by using a heater and convection currents as well. Now, we're going to investigate convection as a means of transfer of thermal energy. Now, in the example of the kettle boiling, you saw the water uh, that was drawn and we simply used little arrows and we said here the particles are moving faster and more space in between them so they move up and down. But the problem is water is transparent and you can't actually see it. You can't see these currents unless you have something in the water. Now in our last lesson, we spoke about the mystery of the dancing peas and we showed how peas bounce up and down in boiling water because they're carried by these convection currents. So we know that convection is going to be the movement of the particles, but it's often difficult to see these currents if you're looking at a liquid which is transparent or in the gas around us, which is also, we can see through it, it's, it's not an opaque substance. So we need to use a colored compound in the water to help us visualize the process. What we're going to do is, we're going to put some colored substance into the water. We're going to then heat the water slowly and we're going to see if this colored substance can be carried around our sample of water in the same way that I've described it with arrows and dots. All right, so let's have a look what we're going to do. There is a compound called potassium permanganate. Do you want to try and say that at home? Potassium permanganate and it's a beautiful bright purple crystal but although it's a solid crystal at room temperature it can dissolve in water so let's describe what we should do we should take a beaker and into the beaker we're going to put a volume of water. So we're going to pour some cold water into our beaker. Then we're going to take a pair of forceps and we're going to take a little crystal of 
potassium permanganate and we're going to gently place it in the bottom corner of our beaker. I know it seems very strange to have a corner of a cylindrical object, but we're going to place it against the wall and the base of the beaker. In other words, not here in the middle. We're then going to introduce a heat source from a Bunsen burner, from a candle, or from a gas burner, right directly underneath our purple crystal of potassium permanganate. So that's what we should do. If you get to do this investigation in class maybe, there are some things that you need to remember. You mustn't just toss these crystals of potassium permanganate all over into the water or you're not going to see the convection currents properly. You're not going to be able to visualize it clearly. You've got to very gently gently place that little crystal at the bottom of the beaker and the other thing is the heat source must be directly under that little crystal. So those are important things to remember to make sure that our investigation works properly. Now let's describe what you would observe. Remember that our crystal was here where the wall of the beaker and the base of the beaker met and our heat source is providing heat energy. And this is a photograph of what we see happening and I want you to study it very carefully. Can you see that there appear to be little currents of purple dye moving around in the water. Right, we can see them very carefully. We can see that the majority of the purple seems to be up at the top of the water sample and we can see that some of these little swirls or currents of dye are starting to move downwards. So can we describe what we're observing now, not just using descriptive words like swirls of purple and moving up and moving down. Can we use scientific language to describe what we're observing? So let's start. Okay, the water at the base of the beaker is going to start becoming hotter going to increase in temperature and we know that heat energy is the transfer of energy from something hot to an area of coolness. So we know that the little particles of water that are here at the base of the beaker right over our heat source these little particles are going to move faster. Why? Because they have gained kinetic energy. They're going to move faster and that means they're going to spread out. They're going to have greater space between the particles. So at the beginning, if we had a little, could visualize a little sample of water, we would see that we've got particles in our water. And if we're heating the water in the same size, we can see that our particles are moving further apart from each other. And that means that the water in this area is going to become less dense. And that means that the water particles are going to move upwards. Now at the same time we've got our crystal of potassium permanganate which remember dissolves in water and as it dissolves slowly particles of the potassium permanganate are also going to be carried upwards by these currents of water. So the currents of water 
are going to have the dissolved potassium permanganate in it and they are going to show us because the potassium permanganate is purple it's going to show us the route that these warm currents of water are taking and it's going to show that as we get to the top and as some of our heat energy is lost from the system we're going to see that those particles lose their kinetic energy and we start to see these convection currents of potassium permanganate crystal that has been dissolved being carried on the currents of the water. So we can actually see the pattern of movements of the currents of water even though we certainly can't see the particles of water themselves, they're far too small and the water is transparent. So by adding this dye substance you don't have to use potassium permanganate, right? You could try this using a grain of powder of food coloring. It won't work as well as the potassium permanganate, but you could try it and you could, if you have a glass um, beaker that can go or a, a glass bottle or a glass container pot that can go on the stove, you might be able to see this by placing a few crystals of food coloring into the water. Now let's use what we have learned to solve a real life problem. This is Dr. Dyer. She wants to make her patients feel comfortable in her examination room. Maybe they have to take off their clothes for her to examine them and she doesn't want them shivering. Or maybe in summer she wants them to feel nice and cool so they don't get overheated in the exam room and then she doesn't know if they're hot because they have a fever or if they're hot just because it's a hot day. So she has bought a heater for winter and she's bought an air conditioner that she wants to use in summer. Now here is her exam room. Where should she place these appliances in her examination room for maximum benefit? And remember, maximum ben benefit is heating her room in winter and cooling it in summer. Now from what you know about convection currents, we know that hot air or hot air particles rise. We know that cold air or cool particles are going to descend or drop. So where should we put the heater? Should we put the heater up here on her wall? Should we mount it high up near the ceiling? Or should we place the heater on the floor? Likewise for our air conditioner. Should we place our air conditioner high up or should we place our air conditioner on the floor? Well, our heater is going to be producing hot air which is going to rise and it's going to flow around the room in convection currents. On the other hand, our air conditioner is going to produce cold air, which is going to fall and it's going to move around in convection currents. So we place the air conditioner at the top near the ceiling and the heater at the bottom near the floor. So today you've learned about convection in real life application in your rooms for heating and for cooling. And so you know where to place your heaters, where to place your air conditioners. And maybe if you have adult supervision, you can do your experiment with convection currents and food coloring in the kitchen. Remember, don't go heating up substances in the kitchen without some supervision or you're going to burn yourself. In our lesson next time, we're going to look at the third way in which heat energy transfers are accomplished. We've learned about conduction, we've learned about convection, we're going to learn about a third mechanism 
of heat energy transfer. So from me, Helen, today, that's it. Goodbye. Thank you.